programming on WTTW is made possible in part by viewers like you and by the following. Hey Chicago, I'm Harry Lennox, and here's a few words we all need to hear right now. COVID-19 has taken the lives of so many and has distanced us from the ones we love. But thanks to science, we have vaccines that can help us get back to our most full lives. The vaccines are safe, they'll save lives, and we all need to be in this together to come out of this pandemic. In the meantime, wash your hands, wear a mask, watch your distance, and please, when it's your turn, get vaccinated and help protect Chicago. For more information, visit chicago.gov slash COVID vax. In 1945, Walter Smith Sr. opened a family business in his name. Four generations in, and the Smith family remains committed to the ideals he set forth. Offer furniture for all Chicagoans, including a variety of styles and price points, and provide service to all who enter our doors, including in-store and in-home design assistants. We look forward to welcoming you into the Smith family, just as we have since 1945. WTTW programming originates from the Renee Crown Public Media Center. Calling it a it's all over the world. And it's just exposing something that's always been there. It's a matter of life and death. I would like to believe that there is hope. Tonight at 10 on WTTW. I'm Alice. I'm Kathy. And you're, you're watching, watching WTTW in, in Chicago. Chicago. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the Polk Brothers Foundation, working to make Chicago a place where all people have the opportunity to reach their full potential. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schatz on the show tonight. Some colleges and businesses are imposing mandatory vaccination requirements. Are they justified and are they legal? I'm sick of it! Republican frustrations boil over in Springfield as new leadership promises changes. We'll hear from four state lawmakers. This is a, a public health problem. The Illinois House backs a plan to remove toxic lead service lines in the state and it wants Congress to pay for it. There is no organization that can replace the Chicago Tribune. New information on 11th hour talks to prevent an imminent deal to have controversial hedge fund Alden Global Capital buy out the Tribune. Watching years worth of pandemic related news can cause burnout. How to avoid stress while staying informed. And Chicago is investing millions of dollars in public art through a new initiative called Arts 77. But first, some of today's top stories. Vaccinated Chicagoans could be getting a vaccine passport next month, allowing people to attend summer events and concerts like Lollapalooza. The city's top doctor, Allison Arwady, wouldn't give too many details about the potential vax pass, saying a formal announcement could be coming in May. The idea is to incentivize younger residents who may be less likely to get the vaccine. I would hope that for most people, their, their main incentive is to be able to stay healthy, uh, keep their families healthy, keep their um, communities healthy. But we also know younger people in particular uh, may be excited about uh, the idea of getting into events, for example, that might be limited to people who are vaccinated. So uh, we're exploring some possibilities of concerts uh, or events uh, that might not be just youth focused, but a lot of this would probably have a youth flavor to it. Coming up in the program, we'll explore legal concerns about businesses and universities requiring the COVID vaccine. 2,500 more people have been diagnosed with the coronavirus since yesterday, and 23 people have died, according to Illinois public health officials. The state's total case count is at 1.325 million people, and 21,858 people have died. Just over a third of the state's population has been fully vaccinated at 30%. The city of Chicago hit a milestone today as well, with over 2 million vaccine doses administered. Governor Jamie Pritzker signs a new law that seeks to bridge racial health care inequities across the state. It's the last of four major pillars of legislation from Illinois' Black Caucus. We experience more negative health outcomes 
as a result of implicit bias among medical professionals. A, a black person's life expectancy on average is less when compared to a white person's life expectancy in Chicago's Austin West Side neighborhoods to the Chicago Loop. The Illinois Health Care and Human Services Reform Act seeks to expand health care access and equity by, among other provisions, including implicit bias training for medical professionals and identifying high violence communities. It also aims to improve children and women's health care as well as mental health care and eliminate the Medicaid backlog. And coming up in the program, we'll talk with a panel of state lawmakers about the budget and more. And now to Phil Ponce and questions around mandating COVID vaccines. Phil. Brandis, this fall, more and more colleges and universities are making COVID-19 vaccination a requirement for staff and students. But so far, the vast majority of employers are not requiring the same of their employees. But when can vaccines be required and what rights to refuse does a person have? Joining us to discuss these issues are Andrew Challenger from job outplacement firm Challenger Gray and Christmas. Al Genie, Professor Emeritus of Business Ethics at Loyola University, Chicago, and Colleen Connell, Executive Director at the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois, and thank you all for joining us. Colleen Con Connell, if I can begin with you, uh, do colleges and private employers have the right to mandate, require their uh, students and employees to get a vaccination? Word Phil, yes. Uh, vaccine mandates by uh, the government or school or an employer can be consistent with civil liberties principles when, as is the situation now, there's a grave threat to public health, the vaccines are safe and effective, and there are no equally effective, less intrusive measures available. How about the federal government? Could the federal government, it hasn't so far, obviously, but could the federal government say, okay, this is, a, we're, we're re-entering a critical period again. At this point, all citizens must be vaccinated. Does the federal government have that power? So, Phil, I, I think that every um, mandate would have to be evaluated in terms of the context and the scope of it. Um, but theoretically, yes, so long as there were, for example, exemptions for people who had health issues that um, would make accepting the vaccine a real risk for them. But our experience has been really that most mandates have been more focused as, for example, um, you know, elementary schools for a long time have required proof of vaccination against childhood diseases as a condition of being, you know, admitted to school. Likewise, we're seeing that this fall, as a number of institutions, um, including several here in Chicago, have uh, advised students that if they want to be present for in-class learning, they need to be vaccinated. Uh, Andrew Challenger, uh, right now your company found that in a recent survey of human resource managers, only 3% of companies were going to mandate that their employees get vaccinated. Why do you think that number is so low? Yeah, it is. It's a really low number. And clearly, most companies would love to have their employees vaccinated, not have that risk of an outbreak uh, within their offices. Uh, but this has also become a political issue. It's an issue that's dividing uh, households, it's dividing uh, companies internally. And it's just too hot and difficult uh, for many companies to make that choice to actually mandate it. Uh, in most cases, companies are instead trying to use carrots to incentivize people, strongly encourage them by saying, hey, uh, we're going to have maskless areas where you can be in in the office, but only if you have your vaccine. Some companies are even considering uh, doing small payments or giving extra vacation days to encourage that vaccine adoption. In fact, uh, your company did a survey of that, and uh, we, we have the results uh, uh, from that where you, you, you mentioned that 29% uh, said that they would consider uh, uh, incentives, that is to say, the carrot and not the stick. Uh, Nine percent said that they are already offering an incentives, uh, incentives, and uh, less than half said no. Al Genie, we heard from uh, Colleen that businesses, colleges, and even the federal government can require vaccinations. Uh, how do you view the ethics of mandated vaccinations? Well, I think Colleen has laid out perfectly, uh, adequately the uh, the legal legalities involved. But I think the ethical question is so primary. It's about individuals living in commonwealths. If we live in common, what are our responsibilities to others? 
What are our responsibilities to any organization we join? For example, Notre Dame is required vaccination in order for admission to the university. They've also required a certain SAT score. And if I want to go there as a student or I send my child there, I have to comply with those rules. But it really comes down to an old stoic principle. There's no such thing as a B. Bees only exist amongst other bees in a colony of bees. If that's true, and we want to participate in the collectivity of others, we have to have certain rules. So I think the requirement, the ethical requirement is pretty clear. We are political animals, as Aristotle said, but we need rules in order to engage together for all sides to be comfortable. Colleen Connell, some critics on the, uh, on, on the right uh, take the view that vaccines, social distancing, and uh, face masks amount to what they consider authoritarian intervention. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, I think that's too simplistic, Phil. Uh, government, as uh, as Al said, really um, does have the authority under our Constitution to um, create certain rules of engagement. That the government can show a sufficiently important or compelling reason to enact that rule or regulation. And um, the public health crisis that we have seen unroll over the past year with 572,000 Americans at a minimum dead and more than 3 million dead across the world and a highly contagious disease. Um, uh, the individual dis liberty, um, as you will, to make a decision about medical care, including refusing medical care, um, uh, really uh, does not carry with it the right to make decisions that have a negative impact on other human beings. And so, uh, you know, this is sort of the law, again, behind sort of public health regulations. Um, you, can, you can refuse a blood transfusion, even if your doctor says that um, you will die if you don't have it. That right to refuse life-saving medical care for you does not carry with it the right to endanger the community. You can't stand in the middle of an emergency room door and block, you know, an ambulance from, you know, bringing somebody in to get a blood transfusion. And and you know what? So uh, sometimes when need. we're sometimes when we're interviewing people, we, oh, we can't sure. block yeah. their dogs from bark barking either. Yeah. Andrew Challenger, uh, in terms of uh, vaccinations, what does uh, what does being vaccinated uh, do to someone who's looking for a job uh, in terms of their potential employment? Yeah, when we're talking to job seekers right now, we tell them, let potential employers know that you're vaccinated. It's an asset right now, right? Less than 30% of the population is fully vaccinated in this country. A lot of those people are outside of the working age of population. So if you have that, uh, you definitely want em employers to know. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing in, in the restaurant industry right now uh, where they're trying to hire tens and tens of thousands of people, despite the fact that we have a huge pool of unemployed people still because of uh, COVID, more than 8 million people, they're running into artificial labor shortages because there's not enough people that can safely go back to work. Yeah. Al Gini, we heard, uh, we heard uh, at the top of the show that the city is contemplating what they're calling a vax pass, that is for young people. If you have a, yeah. uh, a pass that you can uh, more easily enter into uh, festi music festivals right. and that sort of thing. Are, are you okay with that? Uh, the, the prospect of, you know, showing papers, there's such a... There's, there's such a, a a lot of baggage attached to that sort of no, thing. No, I'm how, not sure. How are you that. with that? First, I'm not sure of that, Phil. First of all, I, I've been vaccinated, so I've got my card, and I keep it in my wallet should I be asked. Uh, and by the way, in Israel, they're doing that already. You could go to theater if you show your certification that you've been uh, that you've been inoculated. So I think again, under the rubric of commonwealth, the well-being of the commons, that is, all of us who are participating in it, it's not an extraordinary, and in fact, it's an enlightened position. And I think we have to remember. This is a plague, and in my lifetime, we've lived through three plagues in the society, polio in the 50s, the AIDS epidemic, that was, uh, and then in 2002, the SARS thing, which has at least been contained. But polio doesn't exist as a major disease anymore because of vaccinations, because of that requirement. So I think there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of most information about these vaccines, but even the people who have been sick, who died, unfortunately, uh, and the uh, vaccine, the one-shot vaccine, that's eight people and four million. I am sorry for those eight people. But when we consider the well-being of millions, risks have to be taken and ethical obligations have to be lived up to. And that's where we'll have to leave it. Al Gini, thank you so much. Likewise, uh, Andrew Challenger and Colleen Connell. Thank you all.
Thank you, Phil. And now to Amanda Vinicky with a panel of state lawmakers. Amanda. Thanks, Phil. State lawmakers are grappling with some big issues this spring session, including what the next budget will look like in the wake of the pandemic and a growing pension deficit. And they've got just about a month left to figure it out. So joining us to talk about how they're going to get to all of that and much more, State Representative Will Davis. He's a Democrat from East Hazelcrest and serves as a member of the budget negotiating team. State Representative Tim Butler, a Republican from Springfield who serves as an assistant GOP leader there. And State Senator Sue Rezin, a Republican representing parts of central Illinois. She serves as a deputy leader for Senate Republicans. And last not least, State Senator L.G. Sims, a Democrat from Chicago's South Side. He's chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee and vice chair of the redistricting committee. Thanks to all of you for being with us this evening. Thanks and for having us. Thank you. Senator Sims, let's actually begin with you. There's, again, a month left before the scheduled adjournment date. Always, people want to know what is going on with the budget. Is there a proposal? And does that include any sort of tax increase to pay for it? Well, there's certainly a proposal, Amanda. Uh, the governor introduced his budget uh, uh, several months ago, and we've been uh, using that as our guide and evaluating that. But what's most important, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, we've been trying to evaluate the guidelines that outline how those how those dollars can be spent. Uh, so yes, there's a, there's a proposal. Uh, we've certainly been evaluating that and working between uh, the, both chambers. We've had we've had we've heard all of the state agencies here in the Senate through the Senate Appropriations Committee and our various subcommittees. So we've heard all of the agencies now, and now it's just trying to determine and figure out uh, what the next year's budget proposal will look like, but also what the current year budget looks like. So that what what we've got to get out of, got to get out of man is looking at our budget process as a one-year exercise. This has got to be a multi. We've had we need to look at multi-year solutions to deal with the structural problems we have. And that's what we're doing here in the Senate. And I know my colleagues in the House are doing the same. And we do know that structural budget very much still exists in Illinois, although certainly helped out by that $7.5 billion in COVID relief coming from the feds. Now, Senator Resin, is that enough to stave off major cuts, to stave off a tax increase? For instance, can it be used to pay down some of that pension debt? Well, it's important to know that this over $7 billion influx of money from the federal government is a one-time payment. So um, the governor's office had said they're going to use almost half or over three, three and a half billion dollars to pay off, uh, you know, loans that we do have. So then that leaves us with another three and a half to four billion dollars. Um, and as you can imagine, many people uh, throughout the state and many departments are looking for, they have challenges because of the pandemic. If you look at education, we have a huge learning gap because of the pandemic and e-learning and students that have fallen off from uh, e-learning and not attending school. So we need to make sure that the money is spent wisely and also recognize that we cannot start new programs that are permanent. This is a one-time influx of money it's meant to help the so, state get back on its feet, but that's all. You know, education, Senator, Representative Davis, that is something that you had criticized the governor's package originally for not giving enough money to education. It, does this federal relief money peg that hole, or does this, again, put Illinois in a very difficult position down the line because that $7.5 billion is not expected to come annually? Well, relative to the uh, formula that we have, or we call it the EBF, unfortunately, the federal guidelines said you can't, we can't call the federal money EBF money. So in that case, the governor's proposal does not add any new revenue to the EBF formula. And that's the, the reality of it. The federal monies will go to school districts using a Title I formula, which is kind of a low-income formula. But that means even some of the wealthiest schools in the state of Illinois may get money because they do have low-income students in their classrooms. So it's hard for us to call the federal money EBF. Um, what we are still trying to do is find money in the in the state budget so that we can actually fund the EBF this year so we're not going a second year without adding any new money to the school funding formula. So, Representative Butler, this will be, I think, the final question on the budget here. 
where are we at? Better than expected with more tax revenues coming into the state than had been predicted and then this federal relief money or is Illinois' budget still in the tank? And what do we do about it? <laughs> Well, we still have uh, structural problems, as, as we mentioned earlier. I mean, we're going to continue to have structural problems, I think, for, for years to come because we, we haven't tackled the, the pension issue yet in, in Illinois. And it's going to continue to be uh, an issue when we, when we craft the budget. I think immediately what we have in front of us is an opportunity with the federal money to, to pay down a significant portion of our bill back backlog, which stands, I don't know, when I checked the other day, at about $5.5 billion. And I think to, to Representative Davis's point, uh, we didn't follow through on our obligations with the evidence-based funding last year. What can we do to make sure that EBF is is try you know the best that we can to to make sure that we're not that we're living up to our obligations that we that we passed a couple of years ago that so many of us supported. Lots so, of legislators look, we, wanting that money for schools. I uh, want to move on to the, the census figures, which came out in Illinois is set to lose a seat in its congressional delegation uh, that is right now going to be left to Democrats in the legislature to draw a new map for both your own seats in the Illinois House and Senate as well as for Congress. Now, as a candidate, Governor Pritzker said that he would veto any plan not drawn by an independent commission. Now, here's what he had to say today. Well, as I've said, I will veto an unfair map. I do believe that Democrats and Republicans should get together to adopt this map. I hope that Republicans will choose to work with Democrats on the map right now. It looks like they're just saying no. So, Senator Sims, how is what we've heard from Governor Pritzker today not a total backtrack to his promise as a candidate that he would veto any map not drawn by an independent commission? Well, certainly, I'm not going to speak for the governor, but I think what you know, what I heard the governor also say in, in, in other settings is that he wants a map that's fair and that reflects the diversity of our state. And that's what we intend to pass, a uh, map that is fair, uh, that represents the diversity of our state, that includes the voices of in communities of interest from around the state. That's why you see us having so many hearings uh, for, around the state uh, of not just the full com uh, redistricting committee, but also our, our subcommittees and also this is the first time in, in the history where we where individual communities of interest have the opportunity to draw their own map so we put on we put a portal out where individual communities of interest can go on submit maps and we know that there have been hundreds of people who've done that uh who've gone on who have gone on to that portal and and and, and started their that own process. hand at, at drawing a drawing a district a, a, uh, absolutely but yes. but that's but amanda i say this, this is that's different than what we've seen in the past that's a a process that is very different than what we've seen in the past. It's a more transparent process, and that's why you're going to have a map that is fair and meets our constitutional obligation and deadline. Representative Butler, do you buy that you're part of the redistricting committee for House Republicans? It's not like the GOP has been ostracized. You've been part of those committees. Do you buy that Democrats are going to come up with a fair map? Well, we've certainly participated in the hearings. We have four House Republican members who are who are members of the House Redistricting Committee. We've had a lot of our members participate in the regional hearings. But the problem is um, the, the questions go unanswered from, from our side. We've asked significant questions about the use of data. We're not gonna have the decennial census data until August. Um, you know, what data is gonna be used by the majority to draw their maps? There's been a lot of questions from, from advocates and people who've testified about the use of ACS data or the process, um, transparency, especially once the maps are unveiled what will the process be uh, for, for citizen involvement? And look, at the end of the day, you know, we've, we have put out proposals. And, for, and so for the governor to say that, that we're not coming to the table is, is ludicrous. I mean, I've had a bill out there for a commission since last year. Senator Berrickman had a bill out there for a commission. Those have been ignored. Now, that's the will of the majority and it's fine, but, but we, we are participating in this process and we have huge concerns about the fact that what data is gonna be used if the maps are drawn by, by June 30, because we don't believe the data that, that can be used for, for June 30 reflects truly the, the diversity, like well, Senator Sims said, of, of Illinois. And Senator Sims, just real quick answer, are you going to use ACS data, yes or no? We haven't made that decision yet. I mean, those discussions are still ongoing. Still uh, ongoing. We, we haven't made that decision. All right, and that I, is where we I would will like have to. to well, well, we'll come back. We've got to leave it here for now, but we will be joined by each of you legislators again later in the program. And we'll discuss a possible ComEd rate hike, but for now, our thanks to State Representatives Will Davis and Tim Butler, as well as State Senators Sue Resin and LG Sims.
And now, Paris, we go back to you. Thank you, Amanda. There are an estimated 700,000 lead service lines carrying water to homes in Illinois, more than half of which are in Chicago. Lead in drinking water can cause brain damage in children, among a slew of other health problems. Last year, the city announced a plan to slowly replace those lines, but it is yet to get underway. Now, state lawmakers want to tackle the toxic problem, and as Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports, they want Congress to foot the bill. For the last 14 years, Maria del Carmen Macias has offered daycare out of her Belmont Cragen home. A couple years back, the Department of Children and Family Services notified Macias that to keep her license in good standing, she'd have to test the water in her home for lead. So, this one needed two tests. If I have the fridge that makes ice, I need to send them a big one with ice mm -hmm. and the bathroom, see, okay. twice. Macias says her building's lead levels came back normal, but she was frustrated the state didn't offer enough guidance on how to test her home's water or what to do if the lead levels were too high. There is no guidance and no clarity, and providers are, you know, just scrambling for information. Macias credits the nonprofit Elevate Energy for offering her training and financial support, and she's been helping other child care providers get educated and take action. But she thinks house by house lead mitigation isn't enough to tackle such a huge problem. It should not be on the shoulders of the providers, it should be the state. Even if I don't have a daycare, what if I have a lot, a lot of lead in my pipes? It is affecting me, it is affecting my family, it is affecting my children. State lawmakers agree. Last week, the Illinois House okayed a bill that calls on utilities to find and replace lead service lines carrying water to customers' homes. Depending on how many pipes the utility has to replace, they'd have between 15 and 34 years to get it done. Everyone should be able to drink clean water without any issue. The bill originally set aside $200 million from a new fee to help pay for replacement, but that was removed to secure enough votes. Instead, supporters are looking to the Biden administration's infrastructure plan to fund the money, which left some Republicans skeptical. I would like to see this bill be allowed to go forward with an idea of how it's going to be paid for, because it is going to have to be paid for. Biden's infrastructure plan includes $45 billion to replace lead service lines nationwide. Justin Williams of the Metropolitan Planning Council says the state needs to be ready to act as soon as any money is available. Illinois and Chicago have more lead service lines than any other state or city in the country. Um, so it's a pretty substantial problem at both the city and state scale. Williams says funding from Congress would make a big dent in the problem, and he wants government at every level to come up with a plan. The state of Illinois is likely going to have a, a long-term role to play in finding dedicated funding to deal with this problem. And then finally, municipalities and water utilities are also going to need to identify sustainable and equitable uh, revenue sources to address lead service lines in their community. Williams hopes the lead service line replacement bill will pass the state Senate. Macias is hopeful too. She says it's a critical issue, especially for people of color and people who don't make much money. To have a clean water is not a luxury, it's a human right. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. And the bill making its way through the General Assembly would create an advisory panel to help identify funding if federal money doesn't come through. And it would require utilities to come up with a plan by 2027 to replace service lines. And up next, a look at efforts to prevent hedge fund Alden Global Capital from buying the Chicago Tribune. So stick around for that. The clock is nearing midnight for the Chicago Tribune and efforts to prevent a takeover from controversial hedge fund Alden Global Capital. But Chicago Tonight has learned that there are still active talks behind the scenes to come up with a bid that could derail the proposed deal. 
Many current and former Tribune reporters say they believe that could be the only chance the city has to save the paper. Paris Schutz has the latest on this in Paris. There is a potential new buyer for the Chicago Tribune. Well, not exactly yet, Brandis. What we're told is there are still active talks behind the scenes, discussions uh, to come up with a plan to prevent what you said, Alden Global Capital, from a full takeover of Trib Publishing. And sources confirm to WTTW News that representatives of some of the city's most noteworthy philanthropic organizations have stepped up in these latest discussions. Now, those organizations include the MacArthur Foundation. That's known for doling out the Genius Grant every year, worth more than 600000 to the recipients. And it says it manages about $7 billion in philanthropic investments around the world. Also, the Pritzker Traubert Foundation, co-founded by Chicagoans Penny Pritzker and Brian Traubert. Notably, they are the sister and brother-in-law of Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, and that organization is known for doling out the $10 million Chicago Prize, among other things, to help spur development in disadvantaged communities. We're also told the New York-based Ford Foundation had been involved in recent talks. Now, what those talks entail, that's another story. There is disagreement in the philanthropic community, I'm told, over whether or not to put together a nonprofit group that would act as the majority shareholder in the Tribune. What I'm told is the representatives from these groups do not want to go that route. So more likely what the talks entail uh, is using the deep Rolodexes that they have of investors, of funders, of people with deep pockets that they know to see if someone can emerge out of the ashes as a potential bidder. Now, the leader of any potential rival bid for the Chicago Tribune is Stuart Bainham. He is a Maryland-based hotel magnate, uh, the chief of uh, uh, Choice Hotels out there. He successfully just put together a nonprofit that bought the Baltimore Sun. Now, he recently had a $680 million deal on the table with his co-investor, a billionaire, inv uh, a billionaire Swiss named Hans-Jörg Wies. Now, that deal would have beaten out the $633 million, or it was worth more, obviously, than the $633 million deal that Alden has proposed. But that deal fell apart when Wies pulled out last week. Now, what I'm told by a source close to Bainham is that he is looking for at least one more wealthy private investor, a deep-pocketed investor, to put a potential bid over the top, which is where some of these civic groups could come into play. Again, it would have to beat out the $633 million proposal that Alden Global Capital has to take over the paper. And earlier today, I spoke with Gary Marks. He's one of two former Tribune investigative reporters who have worked feverishly to find owners for the paper. He told me he's angry none of the multitude of Chicago business and civic leaders have stepped up. Paris, it's unbelievably frustrating and disappointing, I have to say. I do not understand it. You know, we heard this reason or that reason, but we never heard a great reason for why this great city with these great foundations, philanthropic groups, civic organizations, and deep pocket money people, people who've made huge fortunes based in Chicago, not stepping up to buy the newspaper. And Paris, remind us why there is such a, a rush to prevent Alden from buying the trip. Well, Alden Global Capital Brandis is a hedge fund that is known for buying up other news publications like the Denver Post and really cutting to the bone, cutting staff, cutting resources, and squeezing out whatever profits they can from the remaining entities. Alden right now is Tribune's biggest shareholder. It owns about a third of the seats on the board, so this deal would be to buy out that other two-thirds. The paper has dramatically cut staff under Alden's control. Mark says he fears that a total takeover from Alden will have a devastating impact, no, not only on the paper, but on the city and state at large. Our city and state are in crisis now, and there is an ecosystem of journalism here. There are small not-for-profits that are very good at what they do. There is WBEZ, which is doing a tremendous job at what they do. There are other news outlets that are doing a, a tremendous job. But there is no organization that can replace the Chicago Tribune in terms of being the voice of this city, in terms of holding our leadership accountable. The Tribune Publishing Board is expected to vote on a deal May 21st. It is supposed to be imminent because there is no other deal unless an 11th hour deal comes through. Now, 
In the last 20 minutes, we got a statement from the spokesperson for the MacArthur Foundation saying, quote, we are not in talks to buy the Chicago Tribune or the Tribune Company. As a longtime funder of independent journalism and media, we care about news and information and are working to strengthen American democracy by ensuring people remain informed and engaged. Messages to these other foundations as well as to the Tribune board were not returned today. And Brandis, we go back to you. May 21st deadline, Paris. Thank you. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, keeping up with news like police shootings can be traumatic. We talk with a psychiatrist on how this trauma can stick with people. I will veto an unfair map. Democratic state lawmakers control the redrawing of Illinois' legislative maps. We'll hear from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. And a major investment in Chicago's public art through artist grants, program funding, and money towards beautifying public spaces. But first, some more of today's top stories. Four-year college enrollment for Chicago public school students fell by just 2% in the class for 2020, despite the challenges of the pandemic and the shift to virtual learning. Researchers at the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research, Research though, say the two-year college enrollment rate fell by 18%. That's for two-year college enrollment for CPS grads, compared to a nationwide drop of 13%. Experts believe those students may have borne the direct financial impacts of the pandemic and had to take on other responsibilities beyond school. This new study also shows that CPS grads already enrolled in a four-year college at the onset of the pandemic returned to school at similar rates as previous years, and several state and private universities across Illinois experienced increased enrollment and or retention. If you were concerned about getting your new real ID in time for the October 1st deadline, worry no more. The Department of Homeland Security has extended the deadline again, this time all the way to May 2023. DHS cites the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the impact it was having on issuing driver's licenses and state IDs nationwide. This means current Illinois driver's licenses and state IDs will be accepted at airports and federal facilities. Meanwhile, the state has also extended expiration dates until August 1st of this year. And now back to Amanda with more from state lawmakers on a potential ComEd rate hike and more. Amanda. Thanks, Brandis. Earlier in the program, we discussed the state's looming budget battle. And now we're joined again by state representatives Will Davis and Tim Butler and state senators Sue Rezin and LG Sims. Appreciation to each of you once again. When we talked previously, Senator Rezin, you were trying to get something in about redistricting in these, these maps, which Republicans fear will be gerrymandered. What did you want to add? Listen, uh, as long as my colleagues across the aisle want to use the ACS as a uh, point for drawing the maps, this is not a fair map. ACS data is simply an estimate. We have always used census data, which will be coming uh, and available to us in September, so this fall, which still gives us plenty of time to meet our constitutionally constitutional deadline of October 4th to pass a, uh, a fair map. So. You know, there should be no rush using this estimated data from the ACS. Uh, it has been proven in two other states that use it. It's been struck down at the state Supreme Court level. And that so is the, the American Community Survey versus the census data delayed from the feds. Democrats mm -hmm. want to get this map drawn looking to the end of June deadline in which it would be, power would be given over to an uh, independent uh, commission. Amanda, Amanda, you said something interesting, delayed by the feds. That was the previous right. administration. We, we'd be well on our way had the previous administration not done what it had done to delay this process. And our, I think our objective is to try to try to pass something by uh, May 31st. I think that's what that, we are supposed to do. And unfortunately, we may, may, may or may not be able to do that because of the feds. And that just changes the way the process then works across the board. And I, and I, I think Representative Davis is right on point. You know, the, the framers of our Constitution did not require that we have to use census data, but they said use uh, we, that we do have a responsibility to get the redistricting process done. The legislature does by June 30. Now we're, we're going with whatever that whatever those whatever that data is that we're going to use. We haven't made that decision yet, but we do have an obligation. I think it's uh, you know it's it's fair. Uh, it's 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 in, it, uh, to me. I think it's misleading for us to say that we don't have the six, the June 30 deadline because it's clearly delineated in our state's constitution that we do have a June 30th deadline for the legislature to redistrict. Uh, if we don't pass that map by the by June 30th, then that that process is turned over to a partisan 
uh, commission that will then draw is then be in charge of drawing that map. Right? He, he, it's, evenly it's, divided a, it's a it's a it's evenly divided. But if that map, if that commission is not uh, is not does not come up with a map, then a then a a, a, a ninth member is added to that commission, and you will get a very we, partisan result. Uh, right now, you have the legislature. Uh, in charge of that process, both Democrats and Republicans are participating in this process, and we're, we're going to continue. We're going to complete that 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 process before the June 30 deadline. So, speaking Amanda, of partisanship, if the, if, the, if, the, if the Democrats want to invite me in the room and they draw the maps, that would be you a volunteer, truly huh? process. Yeah, absolutely. Volunteer. The maps are being drawn by the party in control as we speak. It is not an independent map, and it is more importantly not reflective of all of these different communities who were asked to go out into their community and get um, asked for census surveys. And the fact that they're not using the well, census we, surveys is disingenuous. We cer well, we'd certainly love to, if there is a map that the Republicans want to, want to propose, we'd certainly love to see it. But you cannot just say no. We welcome you into governing with us. And we want you to be a partner. And we, we want you to be partners with us. And we've invited you in. Uh, that's why we're having these committees everywhere in the state, not just not just in the in, the, in, the in areas controlled areas. by represented by Democratic Democrats, but throughout the right. state. We are in Southern Illinois. We're in Northern Illinois. We're in Central Illinois. You, all throughout the state. So we welcome and, you in. But and participation the, 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 has been it, robust. This absolutely. conversation, I think, we, very much shows the level of, it, of how much maps matter and also how much each of you care. So I, I want to also talk about speaking of bipartisanship versus partisanship. The hopes were high for cross aisle collaborations with Michael Madigan's ousting, but frustration have boiled over in Springfield. Take a look. We represent five million Illinoisans on this side of the aisle. Five million. And our bills are being ignored. I'm sick of it. Sick, sick, sick of it. Representative Butler, no, that was you. Is that true frustration or just theatrics? No, it was, it was true frustration, and, and it really stems from a bill. It's a local bill that, that, that didn't get called last week. When I, when I did my job as a legislator and got it through committee unanimously and hit the floor, and I worked, I worked the other side, and I had enough votes to get it, and it didn't get called. And I think that's, that's the frustration that, that, that we really feel. Now, I'm passionate about my job, just like the, all four of us are, and my passion came out uh, the other night, and uh, luckily most of us had a pretty good laugh about it the next day, but it certainly... You know, oftentimes in the legislature, things get a little uh, a little heated, and uh, you know, I I don't I don't. Uh deny the fact that I, I was passionate about it and passionate about for, for the district that I represent. Something that I expect is going to heat up before the end of May is what is going on with an energy package. We are not even a year out from ComEd admitting to a bribery scandal, and yet there's a possibility that customers for ComEd are going to see a rate hike, a subsidy. So. May I please start with you, Senator Rezin, you in particular are backing a measure that um, appears to, uh, according to a study released by the governor's office, an independent study that would cover more money for ComEd's parent company, Exelon, to keep these nuclear plants open. So can, can you explain what is behind the reasoning for the subsidy? What do you tell constituents who are frustrated? Sure. Well, first of all, it's important to understand that we receive over 50% of our power from the nuclear power plants. We have six plants uh, in our fleet, the most in the entire country. I represent the Energy Corridor of America, so I only uh, I have three of the nuclear power plants, but I have wind, solar, battery, um, uh, coal, and um, combined cycle natural gas. I mean, energy is incredibly important, but it's also important to recognize that Illinois cannot meet its climate goals without nuclear in the energy portfolio. So to, if we would allow just two of our six plants to prematurely close, it would take over 35 years to replace that energy or that power with wind and solar. So these nuclear power plants are assets uh, for the state of Illinois. Uh, they're depressed because of the market. We, we have a very competitive market. And if we want to achieve and reach our climate goals of reducing our carbon footprint, which is a bipartisan issue um, and bicameral issue, then we need to have nuclear online, which generates energy and power 24-7 each and every day of the week. 
So a big battle ahead this legislative spring session. All we've got time for right now, but we've got the month of May to talk it over. Thanks. Meanwhile, to state representatives Will Davis and Tim Butler, as well as state senators Sue Resin and LG Sims. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Amanda, thank you. Over the past year, news coverage about traumatic topics like the pandemic or fatal police shootings have caused many to feel burned out. It may be difficult to strike that balance between maintaining mental health and staying well informed. Joining us now with more on how to strike that balance is Candace Norcott, licensed clinical psychologist and assistant professor at the University of Chicago Medicine. Candace, thank you for joining us. So what are you hearing in terms of stress, trauma from police shootings or pandemic related news? What are people saying? This is such a timely topic. People are really feeling pulled in two directions. One is a desire to bear witness, and that's really rooted in this, if I turn away, what will I miss? And also things feel really big, so I feel like this is the way I'm involved. But they're also feeling pulled because they're feeling this sense of what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is distressing to me. And what we know about trauma is it's not just what happens to our person, right? But it's also we can be traumatized by what we see, what we hear, the stories, and that's called vicarious traumatization. You mentioned, you know, the need to bear witness. Talk a little bit mm. about why we feel that need. Why is it important for us to see and hear the news? Well, some for some communities, there's a historical precedent, right? So when we're not watching, when we don't have visual evidence, injustices happen. And so there's this sense of I've got to be vigilant and I've got to be on it. And then there's also this sense of these things feel so big, right? And this is the way I participate. This is the way I show allyship. This is the way I connect. How can the trauma of witnessing this news, though, how can it stick with people? Well, that's really important. Um, always feeling keyed up. I think part of vicarious traumatization is that it impacts us similarly as if the trauma had happened to us directly. We have changes in our thoughts. For example, the world's unsafe, I'm alone, no one's here to help me. We have um, feeling kind of just hypervigilant, like always, our head's always on swivel. And so think of a car, right? Your car is in park, but your foot's on the gas, feeling like you have lots to do, but nowhere to go. How do, well, how does social media, how does it sort of, you know, suck us further into this, you know, distressing news cycle? Well, one thing that I talk to my clients a lot about is being intentional, right? And social media takes a little bit of that intentionality away from us. My clients talk about they go to bed at eight o'clock and two hours later, they're still scrolling through their social media because the videos keep looping. And so they're not really having a, a sense of control over the media that they're consuming. And so often it's images, stories, anger, other people's emotional experience and expression. And uh, it's hard to turn the, turn the volume down, turn the gauge down when that's the way you're consuming your news. What do you recommend to create the balance, you know, between staying informed but not consuming yeah. so much that it stresses you out and you're then experiencing that vicarious mm -hmm. trauma you talk about? That's a great question. And it's back to that word intentional. I really encourage people to be intentional with how they consume their media. So for some people, they're getting ready in the morning and the TV is just on in the background and it's just running. And so you're taking information in. Maybe you're seeing images that you weren't really prepared to see right before you have to do a big presentation or if you're a therapist before you have to go and listen to other people's stories, right? And so being intentional means, you know, before I'm, I'm gonna sit down and watch news because I wanna be aware of what's happening, but I'm gonna do it not before bed. I'm gonna do the five o'clock news. Or maybe it's not gonna be the news, maybe it's gonna be the news on the radio and you change the medium by which you take it in because sometimes hearing versus seeing and hearing allows you to feel like you have a little bit more control on what you're consuming. So I really, really try to um, encourage people to be intentional. To that end, can you know the more visual news uh, like videos, can that be more triggering for people? It absolutely can, it absolutely can and again, when things are coming up on the screen, you aren't, you don't know what's going to come up next, right? If you're, if the next video is uh, coming up in your feed, or if you're watching the news and maybe now they're going to jump to a story about uh, a war, right? You don't know what images. And, and also, you know, when people have experiences of trauma, whether they've experienced in their lives or not, 
they you don't you never really can predict what's going to activate your trauma you, you have a sense but it could be anything it could be a picture that has nothing to do with what you went through and so sometimes images and pictures and, and that visual medium can just um keep a, a wider door open for what can activate you what advice do you have for people uh who are dealing with anxiety around all of this the biggest thing that I have is to lean into your social supports. So often people kind of sabotage themselves and they say, oh, I don't want to burden other people or I don't want to be a downer. And so they're cutting off one of our most powerful assets when we're thinking about coping. And, and oftentimes it's because people have one sense of how you connect with people or how you reach out for help. But reaching out for help can be just calling somebody and saying, you know, I don't really want to be alone right now. Would you just go to the grocery store with me? Or if somebody's far away, you say, you know, can I call? I don't necessarily want to talk about anything. Can I just, can we just uh, talk about that bad TV show that we both love, right? Even that is using your support system and connecting. Okay, bad television uh, is recommended, <laughs> it sounds like. Candace Norcott, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, take care. Up next, details of a multi-million dollar public art initiative. But first, a look at the weather. The city is announcing a major investment to boost arts and cultural programming. Arts 77 is a recently announced arts program directing an initial investment of $60 million into grants for local artists, public art installations, and cultural programming all across the city. Chicago's Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, the Park District, and other city agencies say they hope the initiative will help boost an urban arts industry that is wounded right now by the COVID-19 pandemic shutdown. And joining us are Mark Kelly. Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events and photographer Tanika Johnson, one of five artists selected to receive a $100,000 artist response grant through the program. Welcome both of you to uh, Chicago tonight. Um, first, thank you for being here. Mark, uh, what was the impetus for this $60 million program and where is the money coming from? Well, first of all, the impetus, the arts are central to the Chicago world, world cultural capital. Sometimes we don't recognize that or honor that. But why did 57 million tourists come in 2019 Chicago? It's because of the cultural vitality of the city, the parks, the museums, theater, music across the city. And no industry has been more devastated by the pandemic. All our stages are empty, our clubs are closed, our artists are unemployed. And so we, we need to bring back the arts landscape. We need to support them and they will play this huge role in bringing back the city. We need a sense of belonging, we need a, a sense of meaning and that's what the arts gives to us. So this 60 million, it comes from a variety of sources. Uh, 15 million uh, public art is, comes from the infrastructure uh, budget that was just passed by the city. Those are public art to inst installations that uh, that you're going to install. I, I want to get to the specifics of sure. where this revenue is going in a minute. But first, uh, Tanika, uh, you're a well-known photographer. You focus your art on social justice issues. Tell, tell me what this $100,000 grant you're receiving through this program means to you and your ability to carry out your mission. Oh, it means that I will be able to work on uh, my next project, which is an invite for people to come to Greater Inglewood because it's focusing on the historic discriminatory housing practices that were done to would-be black homeowners in the 50s and 60s through land sale contracts. And so my project and this funding will allow me to make visible this hidden history by creating landmarkers in Greater Inglewood of those homes that still exist while also educating people about the present day impact this period had on neighborhoods like Greater Inglewood. So not only is it educational, but it will also be an invite to this neighborhood to learn more about it. So this funding will allow me to do that project in partnership with National Public Housing Museum. And we're looking at some of your work right now, and I'm sure that'll be a draw uh, to Englewood. Uh, Mark, so you started to break down. So it's $50 million for public art installations across the city, including some at the new O'Hare terminals being constructed. What are the other uh, programs that this money is going to? Well, it's, it's $15 million for public art, and this is the biggest investment in public art in the history of the city going to our neighborhoods. It's $3.5 in public art that will go 
to the, uh, the re reimagining the international terminal at O'Hare with the largest acquisition of work of Chicago artists in decades. It's $40 million for the Culture in My Neighborhood project. This is in partnership with Chicago Park District, Chicago Public Libraries. We have cultural centers largely in the south and west side of the city. Think the uh, Austin Town Hall, the South Shore Cultural Center, but they haven't lived as cultural space and they haven't been renewed. And so it's a major capital investment to bring them forward. And then we engage the communities and we bring, bring them forward so that they live as cultural spaces. And then all kinds of just grand programs like what you just heard from uh, Tomika. So uh, Chicago presents over $1 million for free outdoor cultural events, theater, music, dance across the city, just to bring the life and energy back to the city. There'll be uh, another $1 million for neighborhood access programs. These are for cultural uh, events in neighborhoods that have been largely disinvested in terms of cultural life. And so then we have to make, go ahead. A way, a way to really activate uh, these neighborhoods. You mentioned some of those c uh, cultural centers like the Austin Town Hall, beautiful buildings uh, out there. So Tanika, one of the things you've drawn a lot of acclaim for is your folded maps project. Remind us what that project was. Oh, uh, it is a visual exploration of the present day impact of Chicago's segregation while also bringing residents together who live on the same street but miles apart from the north and south side. And we're looking at some pictures here. So basically, it's the same address, uh, one address north, say like 5400 north, meeting up with 5400 south. And I mean, yeah. what, what, what came out of that project? What, did, what kind of reaction did it get? Um, well, the response from uh, Chicagoans in general kind of demonstrates that, you know, we do want a different city, that our segregation does not reflect how we truly want to interact. And so that was consistent across the board with all of the MAP twins. And I think that is what is primarily led to the popularity of the project is that it represents how us Chicagoans feel about our city and it demonstrates the many ways in which we disrupted and how we have to continue to do so. Art and art, that's the power of art. That's what art can do. Mark, uh, tell us uh, how artists can apply for some of these grants, some of the grants like the one that uh, Tanika has. Just go to chicagoculturalgrants.org, go to the DK's website. Um, actually, some of these programs, we've tried to strip through the bureaucracy so that it's easier to apply. We want to make sure that diverse communities feel welcomed as, as we put forward this. And I should say, this is just the first installment. Does this, does this 60 million, um, it helps in the recovery, but, but the need is great. And there's announcements to follow because uh, we all need the arts back in Chicago. The arts give us that joy that, that we're all desperate for. And we're going to start to see the momentum come back. The mojo is coming back to the arts landscape of Chicago. Mojo, another great Chicago artist, Muddy Waters, got my mojo rising wow. there. All right, uh, my mojo working, not mojo rising. All right, uh, thanks to uh, Mark Kelly and Tanika Johnson. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And that is our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. President Biden delivers his first address to a joint session of Congress. We have a preview. And investigating artwork from Mexico with a scientific team from Chicago. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.